I woke to the sound of sobbing. Not once, not twice, but on multiple occasions when I was a child, I would be woken up to hear loud sobbing that would get me out of bed, cause me to walk downstairs, to turn the corner, and to look into my kitchen and to see the pastor of my church with his head on my father's shoulder crying uncontrollably. Now, my father wasn't the reason why the pastor was crying. He was the person the pastor came to to cry when things got tough. It happened for George. It happened for Steve that they would sit around our kitchen table and they would just sob. It's actually one of the reasons why I didn't want to be a pastor when God was calling me to the pastorate because I knew someday that likely could be me. And in fact, it didn't take but my first congregation that I had the same experience. There was a woman in that congregation who on one occasion when I did something that was apparently unsatisfying or unpleasing to her, she summoned me to her kitchen table and she promptly put out her finger and sternly gave me the warning and she said, I have run other pastors out of this congregation and I can do the same to you. Now the problem is when someone does that to me, my response is, oh, come on, bring it. And therein lies the problem, right? The unity or disunity of the body of Christ is not just because sometimes you have parishioners and their own sinfulness that assert their way. And sometimes it's the pastors. And the pastors also can do the same and cause that kind of disunity inside of the church. Remember, this is a book that is written to believers, to the church in Ephesus the faithful in Jesus Christ. And you'll remember that the first half of the book is written about who God is and therefore who we are. And the second half of the book is therefore then how shall we live. And last week Pastor Betsy talked to us about this idea of the unity of the church which is not just the big idea of chapter 4. Many scholars believe it's the big idea of the entire book. And she talked about how we need to forbear with one another as God has been forbearing with us. This week, as we go a little bit further into God's intention for his church, a unified body, I begin by exploring these two questions for each and every one of us. The first is this. How does our behavior, our attitudes, and our behavior contribute to the unity of the church? And conversely, how does our attitude or our behavior divide us or undermine the unity of the church? Paul pushes in and begins to answer that question in chapter 4, verses 17, through chapter 5 and verse 20. And his first answer to you and I, as he did to the Ephesian church, is found in chapter 4, 17 through verse 32, when Paul says to us, we should no longer live in darkness. As the Gentiles do and as we once did, we should no longer live in darkness. The reason why we should not do that, Paul tells us in verse 17 and 18, is that living in darkness results principally from wrong thinking about God. Wrong thinking about God. So I tell you this, and I insist on it. Do you hear Paul's strength here? I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding. We should no longer live in the darkness. Paul elsewhere in, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 25 says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So you see, wrong and destructive conduct follows from wrong ideas. From wrong ideas. So for example, that person who sits in front of the computer screen 
and believes that as they look at the pornography in front of them, that it is hurting nobody. Their wrong conduct comes from a very wrong idea. Because that does hurt the person who has become a commodity in the object, objectification of that person. It not only hurts that person that they're viewing, it hurts them in all of their intimate relationships. And it hurts their relationship with their God. And even more fundamentally, this is contrary to our now redeemed nature of who Jesus died for us to be. So that wrong thinking can lead to a wrong behavior that can become very divisive in any fellowship. Living in darkness not only results from wrong thinking about God, living in darkness results in our losing sensitivity to the truth. There is a degradation, decline, and destruction that we see in verse 19 where they're given over to sensuality, indulged in impurity with a continual lust for more. It becomes habitual. Once you have a little bit, what's a little bit more going to hurt? If I make my first million easily, well, then I could easily make my second million. And if I get away with this little bit and nobody seems to be damaged, I could get away with a little bit more. It's insidious the way it feeds on itself, and it becomes habitual. Living in darkness results in a loss of sensitivity to the truth. And living in darkness, well, the result of it, according to verse 18 in this text, it comes from the hardening of our hearts. We hear the truth, and our hearts are hardened, and we no longer receive it anymore. Years ago, in a previous church that I was serving, we were in the process of nominating elders and deacons, and we came across this one guy who everybody agreed would make a fantastic elder. He was a Bible study teacher in the church, and a very good one at that. In fact, he had the largest number of people attending his Bible study. He was very, very gifted. But in the process of the examination, we found that he was having an affair with another woman. When we approached him about that, he said, well, he and his wife weren't actually married. I was confused by that, and he said, well, uh, they've been married technically for 25 years, but for 19 of those years, they had not been living in the same bedroom. And so he felt that she wasn't actually his wife. And when I asked him about the woman he was having the affair with, who was married and had children, he was convinced that she was his soulmate, and that God himself had given her to him. And even though directly confronted with the light of God's word, he refused to believe. We went through that Matthew 18 process. Not only did I talk to him, another elder came with me and talked to him, and then he came and met with the elders. And then he decided because he wanted what he wanted, and he was convinced that he could have what he wanted to have, he left the church. His heart was hardened to the very plain light of of God's Word. The application that Paul gives us on how you and I ought not to live into the darkness and have our hearts hardened is found in verses 20 through 25. You, however, Paul says, did not come to know Christ in this way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, but to be made new in the attitude of your minds by putting on the new self and speak truthfully in true righteousness and in holiness. Put off the old self Put on the new. Putting off the old self goes right to uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We can't hope to be a new person unless we have first died and risen again in Christ. And then putting on the new self, the scripture that is instructive here is Colossians 3 and verse 14. Above all, put on love which is the perfect bond of unity. You see, when we live in the darkness, 
and pursue our own truth with our hearts hardened, our moving into the darkness separates us from those who are in the light. That happens as Paul instructs us here in the church, but as we move further in the weeks to come, in chapter 5 and chapter 6, it happens in marriages, in families, in work relationships. Whenever someone is moving into the darkness and away from the light, it causes division and separation. How we think about God and who he has made us to be affects our behavior. We are made to be like him, him who is the light of the world. So we we shouldn't live any longer in darkness, but what we should do, according to chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, is we should be imitators of God, who himself is the light of the world. We should be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Children naturally want to imitate their parents, whether they know it or not, especially when they're younger, right? The primary example of that would be your son. From the earliest of age, my granddaughter, sitting there purely innocently, has their son leaning over and going, (laughs) sticking out his tongue. And you know what she does? She looks right back at him and goes, Last week we were watching the Steelers game and John was getting all excited. He was saying, go Steelers, go! And Nora looks at her daddy and goes, go Steelers, go! She doesn't have a clue what's going on in the game or who the Steelers are. But her daddy is doing it, so she wants to do it. I'm grateful, all joking aside, that my granddaughter has such a godly father that she should grow up and want to imitate We should imitate our heavenly Father, who is a God of light, not darkness. It's the very first thing he makes. (laughs) He, out of his being, creates light. Paul goes on to say that light is a a life of love. That light looks like a, a, a sacrificial life, just as Christ loved us. And that sacrificial life is a a life that Paul goes on to describe not only has a visual to it, but it has a smell to it. Awaking our very senses to the presence of God, it's called a fragrant offering. When we live in the light of God's truth, that sacrificial way of being, imitating God, becomes a fragrant offering up to him. So the question for us this morning is, how does your behavior smell? How does your attitude smell? When wafted up to the nostrils of God, is it a pleasant and pleasing, fragrant aroma? Or is it the stench of something decaying in the darkness? We ought to be those who are imitators of God. Are we imitating our peers? Are we imitating cable news? Are we imitating the world? Or are we imitating Jesus, who is the light of the world? So if we shouldn't uh, live in darkness any longer, but rather imitate God, who is the Lord of light, the obvious conclusion then found in uh, chapter 5, verses 8 through 20, is that we should then live as children of the light. That's how we should then live. In verse 9, he unpacks that in three concise ways. Living as children of the light results in goodness, in righteousness, and in truth. In goodness. In Luke chapter 18, a young religious man comes to Jesus and calls him good teacher. And Jesus, checking to see if he knows who he's talking to, says, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. I think the other thing Jesus is doing here is he's reminding us that goodness 
is defined by God alone. Not when we pursue our own sense of what is good. That leads us back into the darkness again. It's the light of God's word that tells us what is good because God is good all the time. And all the time God is good, especially today when we come before his word and learn of his goodness. Living as children of the light also means that we live into his righteousness, not our righteousness. Our righteousness becomes a self-righteousness. But Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, not even one. In fact, he quotes that from King David, who in Psalm 14 says this, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There's no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there is anyone who understands, anyone who seeks after God. That all have turned aside. They've become together all corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Not even one. Righteousness. But finally, we're called to live into God's truth. You remember in John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God's word living in Jesus, God's words written, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path that shows us what God's truth is. One of my favorites is Psalm 119 in verse 9, which says, how can a young person keep their way pure but by living according to God's word? In 1976, a theologian by the name of Francis Schaeffer wrote a book that actually was the inspiration for the title of this sermon. He wrote a book that was called, How Shall We Then Live?, And it became a video series that framed and shaped an entire generation of followers of Jesus to understand our place and role in our culture. I'd like to read you a very brief summary of something that was written 40 plus years ago. Schaefer's central premise of his book is this, that when we base society on the Bible, on the infinite personal God who is there and has spoken, This provides an absolute by which we can conduct our lives and by which we can judge society. This leads to what Schaefer calls freedom without chaos. When we base society on humanism, which Schaefer defines as, quote, a value system rooted in the belief that humanity is its own measure, that humanity is autonomous, totally independent, and all values are relative, and we have no way to distinguish right from wrong except for a synthesis, pragmatism, or a utilitarianism. Because we disagree on what is best for the group, it leads to a fragmentation of thought, which has led us to despair and alienation so prevalent in our society today. That was written 40 years ago. It gets even more precise Another premise of um, Schaefer's work is that modern relative values are based on personal peace, that is the desire to be personally unaffected by all of the world's problems, and affluence, that is to say increasing personal income. Schaefer warns that when we live by these values, we will be tempted to sacrifice our freedoms in exchange for an authoritarian government who will provide the relative values values. He further warns that this government will be not obvious like the fascist regimes of the 20th century, but rather will be based on manipulation and subtle forms of information control, psychology, and genetics. This was written 40 years ago. Who knew that Francis Schaeffer, the theologian, would be Francis Schaeffer, the prophet? If you're interested in reading his book and digging a little deeper, I direct you specifically to chapter 12. Chapter 12 of his book, How Then Shall We Live? Schaefer's title of that chapter is Manipulation and the New Elite. How Our Society Has Opened Itself Up to the Coming of an Elite Authoritarian State. 
So the question remains all these 40 plus years later. How then should we live? As if anticipating that, the Apostle Paul in chapter 5 and verse 15 instructs us this way. He says, be careful then how you live. And he instructs us that we should be wise, filled with the Spirit, and we should worship God together. We should be wise. And you know from James 3, the true wisdom only comes down from above. We should be filled with the Spirit, not our own ways. And we should sing songs and make worship together. If we're wise, filled with the Spirit, and worship God, what that points to is a people who are seeking after God in His ways, His truth, and His life. When we seek after our own ways, it moves us into the darkness based on the futility of our own thinking. But rather we, if we would be imitators of God, in light of his word, imitate him who is love. And we live as beloved children of the light. <laughs> when we were finishing our study on this on Monday in our sermon study group, we were sitting around the table and we got to chapter 5 and verse 19 and Jim Lures got all excited, which if you know Jim Lures, that's not hard to do. Jim gets really excited about things. And Jim got all excited and he looked at verse 19. He said, look, this is a biblical mandate for people joining the choir. <laughs> chapter 5 and verse 19 says, sing and make music with your hearts to the Lord. But here's the problem. Some of us were actually looking at chapter 4 in verse 19 when he said that. Chapter 4 in 19 actually says something different. It says, having lost all sensitivity, they gave themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and a continual lust for more. I read that and I thought, well, Jim, that's a strange way to get people into the choir. <laughs> but if you think about it, that contrast is actually quite well, it's quite poignant to not only what Paul is speaking of today, but where we are as a church. 419 over and against 519. 419 is our walking in the darkness, pursuing what we wish to pursue. Our attitudes and our behaviors based on a thinking about God that actually can tear apart the church, tear apart our families, and tear apart our most important relationships. Or, Rather, we find a life that is truly life, marked out by singing hymns and songs to one another, filled with joy and abundance. That's maybe then how we ought to live. Right thinking about God, which leads to right conduct, imitating God as his children living in the light. That is who God has called his church to be.